clap your hands, everyone. <laughs> now, again, Dr. Tamura Lomax, we are so excited. I am so excited to have you here hanging out with us today. Um, this has been at least a few months of, uh, of a lot of fingers and toes crossed. Because uh, I remember when you first uh, went live saying that you were uh, finally finished with uh, what you've called uh, uh, your life's uh, work of just research and, and pulling this book out. I was like, I can't wait to bring you to the Bay. And things opened up. We were able to get you here. And so now you're here. Why don't you just say hello to everyone and, uh, and uh, tell us uh, how you doing? <laughs> well, hello everyone. Thank you for coming out. I'm doing very well. And um, I have to say that it is truly an honor. I appreciate working with you. This is not our first time working together, um, but I have watched your work as you've watched mine. And so I just really appreciate you and the kinship that we have um, been building. Um, I also think, uh, want to thank you for um, bringing me back to the Bay because it's so interesting. Um, <laughs> to return here to do my first, this is my first book talk um, on top of a bunch of book talks. So it's so interesting to be here because I grew up in Mill Valley and part of why I even wrote this book has to do with some things that I experienced there. So to come back here is, is coming full circle. So yes, yes. wonderful. It's amazing how uh, life brings us full circle, you know, and things you don't anticipate um, bring us back to places of importance and, mem and memory. Um, and significance. I know your parents and family are here, so let's give a shout out to, to the, the, the folks that, that produced and gave birth, yes. Now, before we jump into the book, just tell us a real quick um, story of self. Just give us a sense of who you are. I know you have a rich family and you know uh, all kinds of stuff. Just give folks a sense of, of who it is we're getting ready to jump into this conversation with. Yeah, so um, I want to shout out. So my family is right there, but my mom and dad raise your hand. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I am a black girl who's a child of the church. Yes. But I'm also a child of hip hop. Yeah. I am a child of all things respectable and ratchet. <laughs> uh, and so I waver in between those worlds. And so you see that in the book where I struggle through um, those those kind of positionalities, but um, I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I'm a scholar. I, um, my, so I went to seminary um, in California, not California, I went to seminary in Georgia. I went to Candler School of Theology in Emory, at Emory. And um, when I went there, I thought I wanted to be a Christian counselor, because that's what uh, women do when you go to seminary. And um, one day I was radicalized and um, praise God. <laughs> I was radicalized in the river of womanist theology, mm. black theology, just all things black, right? So I love everything black. And um, it changed my life. And so there was a, a class, Kelly Brown Douglas had just come out with Sexuality in the Black Church. And that book gave me language for what I had experienced in my life. And it literally changed my life life and I became, I'm not a black feminist, uh, not, not a womanist, but I became a black feminist and so my politics changed. Now, and so, park mm -hmm. right there, what's the difference between a womanist and a black feminist? Because yeah. for many of us who are in the church, uh, quite frankly, the, the F word, <laughs> feminism, mm -hmm. is quite frightening to the average mm -hmm. black church person. And, yeah. and I, I was trained by some womanists while I was at Duke and so I, and I was, you know, I loved it. I embraced it. I drank as much of the water as I could. Um, but I've always heard or sensed there was some tension. So you mind just parking there, just giving us a quick, we don't give it to your book, just a little quick primer on what's the difference between womanism, feminism, and then a black feminist. Yes, okay. So I do write about this in the, in the book um, explicitly because people always get confused and they say, well, aren't, and, and sometimes people will say, well, womanism and feminism, they're the same thing, and they can be interchangeable. So it depends on what kind of womanism you're talking about, right? But before even getting to that, feminism, right? Femin feminism is a politics, a way of seeing the world, it's a way of living in the world, it's not a biology. It's a, it's a politics, it's how one lives their life, what you expect out of life, how you critique, how you see. And so feminism is a critique 
of social political practices, right, that oppress others. Mm -hmm. So as a feminist, I am concerned with sexism, racism, trans, uh, transphobia, um, uh, homophobia. Those are the things that bother me, classism, all of that. So feminism rejects that, mm -hmm. right? So it's not man-hating, it's not, um, but we do hate patriarchy. Mm -hmm. We do hate patriarchy, and so because patriarchy is about sexist domination mm. and sexist exploitation. Mm. And so as a feminist, I am against that, absolutely. And so um, that's feminism, right? But then there's black feminism. And one of the things that I say in the book is that when you put black in front of anything, it changes. So black feminism is Jeez. not what feminism you, you, is. You just said a word right <laughs> now. Yeah, it is not the same. We have a very intersectional approach. We care about race. Race is central, right? But I'm not only, I'm never just black, mm. and I'm never just a woman. I am both of those at the same time, yes. all the time, yes, yes, right? Yes. And so I'm heterosexual. I'm all those things at the same time. And so in that, I don't get to pick and choose. And so with black feminism, we always care about, at minimum, at minimum, race, class, sex, and gender. So we have a very intersectional um, point of view. Now, when you get into womanism, there was a period in the 70s when um, Patricia Hill Collins, who's a black feminist, um, who were the others? Um, I can't remember right now at the top of my tongue, but I know Patricia Hill Collins and a couple of others, they wrote about, well, we're not really feeling feminism because white women are racist. And so mm. we want to change, we need a whole new word. Mm. And so you get, um, womanist, you get all kind, you get several kinds of womanisms that come out of that. You have just womanism, which, right, it, it flip flops in between. It's like I'm not, I'm a black feminist, but I'm also a womanist. Where, so they're kind of like the same. But you also have Africana womanism, which is very different, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, which is kind, they're actually kind of patriarchal. They have a mm -hmm. kind of African, or not an African, but a uh, well, uh, sort of a patriarchal standpoint. So you have different kinds of women, but then you have. Um, womanism and religion, and these are the distinctions that I make in the book because we often don't make those distinctions when we talk publicly. Mm -hmm. Womanism and religion comes about in the 80s, and it is, it is primarily in the 80s um, with, the, with Jacqueline Grant yes. and Katie Cannon, who just passed away, um, and Dolores Williams. It's their rejection, it's mainly an academic discourse, and it's their rejection of the field, the, 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 uh, white theological discourse that's happening in uh, seminaries and divinity schools, right? And so you have feminist theology coming out and you have black theology coming out and you have black theology rejecting the white theology and black the theologians like James Cone saying, we gotta focus on race. And then you have the white feminists coming out and they're saying, well, we gotta focus on gender and the black women are saying, as they are in women's studies, black feminists are saying in women's studies departments, they're like, wait a minute, where's the space for the black woman? Mm. And so womanist theologians and religion, mm -hmm. which are very different from those other kinds of womanists, they come out and they say, well, we're gonna focus on religion, right? And we're gonna center not only God and spirituality, but the black church. Mm. And so that's a main distinction between black feminists and uh, womanists. But I have a couple notes, because I knew, I'm always asked this and I forget, because there are also differences. But I wanna say about black feminists and womanists in theology is that we're also very, we have a lot of similarities. We both care about black women. Mm -hmm. We both center black women in our narratives. We both care about freedom. So our either theologies or theoretical views, they're both about liberation, mm -hmm. right? So the differences really have to do with methodological approach. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm not a theologian, even though I have a theological background. I'm a religionist, I'm a historian, and I'm a theorist. And so that's how I approach, approach the text. And so like, in Jezebel, you're not gonna get a theology. You're gonna get a historical reading that's also a theoretical reading. And so what I wanna know in Jezebel is, well, how is this figure impacting um, black women who are also religious? How is it being utilized in film and, um, and music? That's not a theological reading per se. A theological reading wants to know, well, um, you know, heart matters, faith matters, and mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a reading inside of the faith tradition. I'm reading as a scholar outside of the faith, faith tradition, even though I'm a faithful person, yes. right? And so it's, that's what makes us different, but also so our, the, our theoretical moves um, makes us different. The kinds of sources we use makes us different, but there's more that's the same. Mm -hmm. Than, than is different. But also our histories are different, mm. right? So womanists, um, you know, womanists, again, they center the black church. 
one of the critiques that I offer in the book is that black feminists do religion, but they have not centered the black church. And truth be told, you cannot talk about black women and not talk about the black church. Yeah. So that is a critique I have actually of black feminists, mm -hmm. right? But, I, but then womanists, they don't necessarily um, do the work of culture um, because of the emphasis on the black church and their critique of black men and black patriarchy is a little bit light, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. Ooh. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> Tap it up, y'all. It's about to get rich. We about to. We about to. We about to hit some deep waters up in here. Um, well, I. I'll just say certainly, um, it's an honor for you to uh, bring this text into the world, particularly in this moment, particularly in this season, in this time. And I. I would love to go as deep into this text with you here as we can, knowing that this conversation will not replace all of us buying the book today. Somebody say amen, right? Amen. And, and doing our own deep dive. Somebody say amen. And the own work that we must do, but hopefully this conversation to all of those who are here and listening will catalyze something within us around all of these distinctions. Because it is true that some of us have as a primary audience or focus the church. Others may have as a primary audience or focus culture or the academy, politics. politics. So all of us need to be able to tell the story of liberation or challenge the systems and institutions in ways that uh, unlock liberation more. But I do believe that all of us are moving in and out of all of these institutions mm -hmm. pretty much every day. Yes. And so to the extent that we can have texts like these, um, it, will, it will very, very much help us. At the end of this, we're so glad to have Dr. Brittany Cooper, who just happened to be in town, Woo! blowing up a bunch of these progressives, somebody say amen, amen. Um, talking about uh, some of her work and, 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 and um, ideas. She's going to join us on stage and just offer uh, a quick uh, response and reflection to, to the text. And then we're going to do some Q&A. So if you're watching online, feel free to write questions in the Facebook uh, chat space, and we'll bring some of those questions into this space. We're going to invite you, if you have questions, please write them down. And at the end, we're going to really reserve some time. We want this to be a dialectic, a, a interactive conversation. Um, and there are going to be a lot of things that I believe will be catalyzed. So let's be ready to learn and open our hearts to hear and be challenged. Um, anything that is not challenged uh, cannot grow. And so let's, let's be ready to grow today. This is a conversation among family. Uh, it's a conversation grounded in love and truth and justice and all of those things can never take us in the wrong direction. So let's let's jump in. Um, I, I, I haven't had a chance to read uh, the book, honestly, because um, I just got it last night and uh, and uh, I, I, I made it through a, 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 the, the introduction and, and I skimmed. But but tell the audience again a little bit about what made you want or need to write this text. And yesterday when we were together doing the training up at the seminary, you talked about this took you 16? 16 years. 16 mm -hmm. years. This is a book 16 mm -hmm. years in the making. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. That's a long journey of writing. Yeah, yeah. So it, the research actually, re between research, writing, rewriting, dissertating, um, all of that, that took 16 years. And, and many of those years were spent um, in archives, just uh, studying and and researching and all of that. But what um, inspired the book happened um, much earlier than 16 years ago. And so I, two, two things, two, two things in particular um, happened to me. Um, one was when I was 11 years old. And then the other was when I was, I think, 14. And so the first thing, and both of these um, are in the beginning of the book. So, so in the very beginning, before we even get to the introduction. Um, and the prolegomena. So at 11 years old, I was, uh, my dad's a pastor, and um, we were in church, and I was at altar call. And uh, I remember it so vividly. I had on a dress that my mother had given to me. It was a, a black dress with a red sash, and it was kind of fitting. And there was a man in church who told my father he could not focus during church because he was overwhelmed with my 11-year-old behind. Lucy is Satan. So he had sexualized me yeah. at 11 years old. And I remember my parents did what parents do. And that was, they want to protect their daughter. 
So you can't wear that dress anymore, right? But it's my mama's dress, I'm gonna wear this dress. But now I can't wear it. And so I'm feeling like my body is a problem. But I didn't invite his gaze, okay? His gaze was the problem. His pedophilic gaze was a problem. You're looking at, you're a grown man and you're looking at a child. And so what this book does is it gives us the language, right, to stop problematizing little girls who are sexualized and grown women who are sexualized, right, and stop problematizing them and instead problematizing the gays. So that was the first thing, right? So, and it took me a long time. I went through a whole process of I'm really hating my body, um, desexualizing myself, trying to walk with my butt stuck in so that no one would see it because I don't want to tempt anyone. Y'all have heard that, right? Where they're over there tempting those men. No, those men are, they're, they're making choices, right, to look at little girls. And so I wanted to switch the discourse. So that was the first thing. I was 11 years old. Mm. Already problematized, right? And so the second thing was when we moved to Mill Valley, California. And I knew I was black when I moved to Mill Valley, California, but what I did not know was the interpretation of blackness until I moved to Mill Valley, California. Mm. And it wasn't just an interpretation of blackness, it was a, a particular interpretation of black femaleness. And so I was hypersexualized there. And I remember, and I talk about what, what this. What age were you? 14. That was 14. Freshman year. I, it was my first semester. And I was trying to fit in. We were from the East Coast. And I was very different from everybody else. They were very Valley, and you know, I was very New York. And um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we were all you know, outside talking. And these are my new friends. I'm trying to fit in. And um, they began talking about sex. And so I. You know, I grew up in a pretty conservative Christian household, and so we didn't really talk about sex. So talking, this was vulgar to me, to, to be talking about sex so outwardly. And so the guys, so even this, just think about the, the guys bragged about, you know, all their experiences and what they knew, and because that's what guys, you know, are socialized to do to prove their manhood through how many conquests. And the girls, um, they bragged about their knowledge, not what they had done. And I was silent because I felt like this is vulgar, this is weird, you know. But what I didn't know is that what sparked that conversation was me. Me being in their mix made them want to have the conversation because they were reading me. They were reading me. I was their text to even engage in sex. And I remember them turning to me and they're like, I know that you have something to say. And I was like, you know, no. And they said, yeah, you have sex because black girls like monkeys, sexual savages. Y'all have sex with anybody and anything. And the girl says, I know this because my father's a doctor. Wow. Uh, he's a gynecologist. And he told me so. And if you know the history of gynecology and racism, then you know that this is like she's telling the truth. This is this, is this embedded idea about this hypersexualization of black girls. And they begin acting like monkeys and, 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 and pretending to be monkeys who were also supposedly black girls. And so from that moment, I hated it there because it was not just a sexualization, they had to humanize me also. And so that followed me. And so it wasn't until I got to seminary reading Kelly Brown Douglas's book that I got language for how black women are stereotyped mm -hmm. and how we are uh, pornotroped into these narratives, this grammar book this grammar book of knowledge. And so what the but Jezebel argues is that America's grammar book is corrupt. Mm. It's, it's grammar book on race and gender. And if you think about grammar books from back in the day, the black and white grammar books, the grammar books teach us um, language and formation, and, right? And systems and how to, you have to practice how to, well, that's what America's grammar book on race and gender does, right? It also teaches us systems and practices and how to see and think about black women and girls. And so what I argue is that the grammar book, this discourse on black women and girls that, that America, uh, first Europe and then America has created, um, it has harmed us in really, really harmful ways to the point where we have picked up the master's tools in the black church and black popular culture. And we utilize those tropes as well. And so you move, uh, so it's not just the, the racist calling us, right, this kind of sexual savage. You can go to a black church and be called, it's not the same, they're not gonna say sexual savage, but they have other language. Yeah. It's the same grammar book. Yeah. It's the same meaning, yeah. right? So that's what got me here. Woo. Yeah. My God, <laughs> Um, that, 
you know, just as a pastor, as a man, as a father, a husband, it's it's so hard to hear <coughs> that at 11, 14, and like you had to wait to seminary to find the language. Mm -hmm. to, to find the language to know that it wasn't me. It wasn't you. It's, it's the gays. We hear that all the time where, where black girls, is, where we're told, you know, stop being fast, stop being promiscuous. Oh, she's loose. So she's, and you know, when black girls have gotten raped or sexually violated, it's like, what were you doing? What were you wearing? Yeah. Not who did it, who raped you? Let's go get them, right? Or it's not that, it's first. But what were you doing? Mm. What were you wearing? Mm. You shouldn't have been there that night. You shouldn't have had that on. Mm. Well, you shouldn't have been flirting anyway. Yeah. You know, it's always that first. And so what I argue is that that's rooted and not in, in well be, before slavery, that's rooted in discourses that began really in the medieval period mm -hmm. and in, in the enlightenment period and the uh, European exploration and that was carried over yes. into slavery and now it's still impacting us. Now, now the use of Jezebel as yeah. the title of your book is quite mm -hmm. provocative. I just want to read it just because of that. I was like, <laughs> what is Dr. Lomas going to do with this to redeem this term? Yes. As a pastor, I was just fascinated yeah. So just hearing you kind of weave your own story of self, what, what was the use of Jezebel? Like, wh why Jezebel as the archetype or the, yeah. the title of, of, of the well, text? Well, two reasons. So first of all, the black slave women who were forced to breed were called Jezebels. Mm. And they were called Jezebels because the people trafficking them and raping them that want to be seen as rapists and traffickers, so, right? And so they projected onto the black women and said, they made me, they were, uh, they were craving and they pressured me. And so it was them. They're having all these mixed race children because of them, not because that's what they tell their wives. That's what they say in the community, right? And, and, and so, the wives believe that? No. I, I don't, I don't think, <laughs> so I said no. <laughs> And maybe they wanted to believe it, but yeah. that's what, that's what, you know, I, I mean, current events seem to show us that. Uh -huh. Well, yeah, they, well, you know, sometimes, yeah. Kind of crazy things. yeah. Yeah. So, um, we believe a lot of things when we don't want to know the truth. Mm. So that's, you know, that's a reality. And Ooh. so you have these, you, slave, the slave system does not happen if you don't have black slave women breeding. It cannot exist. It does not exist, especially if after you don't have black, black women breeding. breeding. If they're not breeding and, and creating more slaves, gotcha. the system cannot work. And especially after the importation of slaves were, was outlawed, you needed, you had to have breeders at that point. And that's when they got really crunk with, in terms of breeding and so, uh, and forced, being forced to breed, because they, they didn't want to breed. That's not what they want. And many, many of the slave women would have killed themselves first or killed their babies because they did not, they did not want to participate in the system, but they were forced to. So you have these um, women, these women, these s slave women being called Jezebels. Well, where, where does that come from? Well, Jezebel comes from the Bible and this reading of Jezebel in the Bible as this whore, yes. right? And so I want to bracket that. So there's this idea that Jezebel is a whore, which I argue in the book is a misreading of Jezebel. Um, but before Jezebel is Black Venus that's happening in Europe, so Sergei Bartman. And so the Europeans already had a discourse on black female sexuality and femininity as being both grotesque, being grotesque, fascinating, right? Uh, grotesque and fasc fascinating at the same time, right? So they were disgusted by it, but yet they were drawn to it. This is already happening in Europe, right? And so it's happening in the medieval evil period. And you have this fascination with the black female body, and you have all of these, so at first it's, it's just a, a fascination, like a lusting out there, and so you have uh, travelers writing in their journals about the Africans they saw and, and sexualizing them, but then it moves into science, and when science attaches to these narratives on, just like on race, right, it kind of affirms these mythological beliefs. And so you have that, and so we call it scientific racism, or scientific uh, racism and sexism. And so this really kind of comes to a head on the body of Sarah Bartman. Um, there are others, but this is the one we know about. And so you have Sarji Bartman, if you've never heard of Sarji Bartman, she uh, was a, from Khoi Khoi, and she was in Africa in the 1800s, and so she um, is found by these European explorers, and they take her back to Europe, um, and I don't, they probably made her promises or something like that, but she does not, she's not like a free woman. Um, she was free in her country. And so they take her back to Europe and they keep her in a cage and she becomes 
um, this uh, curiosity, right? Kind of like a museum figure. And so she's forced to wear a nude-like costume. And, and, they, and what's interesting is they have her in places like the town square and restaurants, right? So just imagine going to really, really fancy restaurants and there's a naked like woman in there and she's there to be looked at because she has a big behind and a small waist. That's what she's, that's, that's what she's there. That's why they were fascinated with her. She had a big behind and a small waist. And so what's interesting about Sarah, so her actual measurement, she was very small. But if you see pictures of her, you think that it's like really outrageous. The same way that black women are, you know, kind of uh, imagined now, right? This, uh, it's the hypersexualization, right? This hypersexualized imagery. But actually, Sarah was like under, she was about four feet and like 114 pounds. So she, she could not, yes, yeah, she was tiny. Wow. She was tiny. So that's their imagination. Their imagination was her, was this really grotesque. And, and so, anyways, her, she gets uh, the anatomist, Cuvier. He does the scientific work. When she dies, she dies at 24. And they don't really care why she dies, but she dies um, after struggle and hardship. And um, he takes her body and makes, a, he couldn't wait to get inside of her body. And so he takes her body and makes a cast of it. And he, uh, while she was alive, they always wanted to see her vagina because they thought that she had special powers in the vagina and the buttocks. So just think about the fascination with black women's behinds well, now, what, what, now. What year was this? This was in the uh, early 1800s. And so they, um, they cut her open, and they get to see the parts of her that she never would allow them to see, such as the vagina. Uh, they could see the buttocks before, but she would never allow them to see the uh, vagina. And so they cut her open, and they realize, oh, she doesn't have special power. She doesn't, that's what they thought, that she had special, there was something special going on. Um, because they were so um, taken. Uh, sexually taken, but they didn't want to admit to that. And so they make a cast of her body, they take her vagina out, rip it out of her body, because they couldn't get enough of seeing it, and they put it on display in a museum in Europe. That display had been in Europe, she had been in the museum, she only came back home to her country, I think it was in the night, it was only like 20, 30 years, what year? So she's spent all this time on display. So, so you could see her, her body in life, but in death, she was immortalized, and so she continued to be on display. That study on her, that racist and sexist study, on her travels to America, and it impacts how the slave, the women slaves are looked upon mm. by the uh, slave owners, so the master class. It impacts how they are also sexualized, right? Because we have to realize this is a discourse that's now happening in science. It's not just someone's journal. It's in science, it's in the museum culture, it's in, um, all, it's in speeches, right? This, this fascination with these African women, and so it travels. And it travels to America, and what I argue in the book is that even though the lines may be crooked, the uh, Europe's Black Venus is, in, is, in, is without a doubt America's Jezebel. It is the Ooh. same grammar, it's the same text, meaning it is the same kind of sexualized savage. And so we get to America and we have Jezebel, but we have this merging though of Christianity right at the center. Yes. That, that Christianity wasn't in the narrative in Europe, but on slave plantations, it is dead set center of this whole narrative and in this operation of breeding and trafficking of black women's bodies. Yeah. I'm, how many ever heard of that? I mean, that's so fascinating. I mean, as someone who's been in church my whole life, um, you know, it is, again, very telling how words always carry multiple meanings yeah. and are operating at multiple levels, often unbeknownst to large numbers of people, but mm -hmm. to those who do know and are able to manipulate those words yeah. and re-inscribe some of these, these terrible, terrible systems and realities and assumptions. Um, it, it is even more reason why voices like yours and others must become much more central, yeah. even inside the church. Because I hear you saying as a black feminist, your, your primary audience may not be <clears throat> church, but all of us who are in church preaching from these texts or at least pastoring or trying to provide some sort of spiritual direction to largely black women, yeah. if we're not grappling with this, yeah. then we are being very irresponsible um, as faith leaders in this moment or season. I don't know if there was an excerpt or, or two that you wanted to read yeah. Um, in chapter one 
uh, that, that brings some of this out or up oh. um, because I, I, I do think um, the way you've, you, you've articulated it, perhaps you, you got even more potent or something, you know, <laughs> on, on, on paper. So go, go ahead and, and just give us a little bit of a read. I have, I have a couple of excerpts um, that I want to, maybe two. So just, uh, Jezebel, Jezebel Unhinged begins with the premise that the discourse on black womanhood circulating and maintained between religion and culture was reappropriated and reproduced in the black church and black popular culture, which in turn churned out a simultaneously normative and dangerous Jezebelian ho discourse. like the pieces is that okay so Europe created right this text the text then travels to America but then black folks pick up the text and begin using it but they begin using it um, as a form of resistance right so not necessarily in the same way that the white enslavers may be using it or that Europe is using it but yet it's kind of the same it's different in that black folks in freedom began using this Jezebel Jezebelian narrative as a way of defining their own humanity, right? So they want, so the way that people often define their own humanity is against an opposite. So what I argue is that Cornell West, he argues, I can't remember which book, but he says that black people are problem people, we have been labeled problem people. And as problem people, we are um, the site of difference. And what I argue is that Jezebel for black people becomes the difference within black difference, right? So in order to humanize ourselves and say, we're not, animals, we're not savages, we are proper, right? So we take on this politics of respectability, but in taking on the proper uh, politics of respectability, we have to take up certain norms. And those norms are undergirded by uh, the Black Nuclear Family Project, mm -hmm. right? So that as a, as a political project, as that being the site of not only respectability, but the site of like citizenry, one com becomes a citizen, you become a part of the democratic process you become fully human. And we still see this in the church, right? If you're not married or a part of the um, heteropatriarchal uh, family unit, then it's like you're not really quite in. And so the, the black heterosexual family, um, which requires a black lady and a black patriarch and some black respectable children, right? That's what undergirds this narrative of how we became human in freedom. Ooh. And so, but to have that, you have to have an opposite. And Jezebel becomes the opposite. You hear, you hear, I've heard this several times where people will say, well, you can't turn a hoe into a housewife. They're made into oppositions, yeah. right? And so the first thing I say, well, first of all, we need to problematize this whole language, yeah. right? And the whole language, that's Jezebel's baby. Yeah. That's, that's the grandbaby of Jezebel. You don't get to talking about whores and all of that. Without, you get that from the whole discourse that already existed in Europe and then in slavery. Right, and so we call black women hoes. Like that's the contempt. Nobody's out here really saying, "Well, she's a Jezebel." Some people in church do say that. They'll they'll call you Jezebel. They, but they, they said the older people, growing up. yeah, older. And they and that's their way of calling you a whore. Right, right, right. That's the way of calling. But younger folks, they don't they don't use all. That. They just call you hoe. Yeah. Right, and so there's this whole discourse Come that we church. have. Yeah, there's a whole thought. Right, thought uh, loose. You know, all of that. And so, but they're all in the same grammar book. Yes, yes. yes. And so you. We have this, this language that's being utilized and we can't always say, well, that's, that's the white racist language. Yeah, it is, that's where it started. But then we have then reappropriated it as a way of humanizing us, but we've in the process dehumanized others and in the process we have um, isolated black women for our own sex, from our own sexual selves. Because in order to be a black lady yeah. and not to be a Jezebel, yeah. you have to um, separate yourself from your own sexual identity and your own sexual desires. Yeah. While men get to be free yeah. doing all that they wanna do. One of the, I wanna make one last point. One of the things I remember growing up, there was a saying in the church where I remember I was like 14, uh, and this was here in Oakland, and I remember 
Um, not, not not here. No, not not, not <laughs> way. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> I, I know I had a lot of work <laughs> to do. But good lord. But a church in Oakland. Okay. And I was Which one's going to name? Unless you want to name drop. Right. <laughs> yeah. There was a there was a church here that we were attending, and the youth were all together, and there was an adult who came to us, and um, the adult said. It may have even been the pastor, so I won't name it, but it was very interesting because he had his own sexual uh, issues. And so he said to the girls, he said, now y'all know, don't be flirting with these boys. Girls keep your panties up and dresses down, right? Raise your hand if you've heard that saying before. Okay, then what has that ever been, what's said to guys, right? What, has anyone said you need to keep your panties, or that panties, but your underwear up and your pants? Who, who's saying that, right? Nobody. Well, the person. My, my dad told me that for the record. Okay. <laughs> one, we have one, okay? But we're talking about a social problem, right? Which is structural and institutional. No, point taken, absolutely. But the guys were told in the same breath, or asked, have you gotten some yet? Yeah. Two completely different messages. Yeah. Who, so who, who are you getting it from? Because we're told to keep our panties up and dresses down, right? Have you gotten some yet? Because the next question was, if they said no, yes. well, are you gay? Are you gay? So these are the discourses that are happening in the black church, That's which right. are also happening in black families and black communities yes. where black boys are being told that you become men through conquest. Yes. And black girls are being told, no, through sex, you become whores. So in the, in the process of this kind of Jezebel, Jezebelian narrative and Jezebel being the opposite, uh, right, being the difference within black difference, she, um, black women's sexual being, our sexual identities, become problematized and seen as we become, our bodies become seen as the site of sin, mm. right? And so what I argue in this book is that no, the discourse, your gaze is the site of sin, yes. not, not our bodies. This has the potential to liberate the black church. Oh yeah, it does. It does. I'm here to tell yeah. you now, we, this, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is some important work. Um, and I, I want to keep going, but I got all kind of things that I just know we, we have to reckon with. We have to wrestle mm -hmm. with everything you're saying, and we ain't even halfway through. <laughs> so come on, let's keep moving, because, okay. you know, the Lord knows that uh, there's so much more. Now, um, speaking of the black church, in your book, you, 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 uh, you, you're not name dropping about the churches in Oakland, but you are name dropping some folk in your book, Touch Your Neighbor, with permission, of course, with permission. I do, I do. Um, the so book, <laughs> uh, the, my, the, my, my sister friends have been, you know. We critiqued them yesterday. Yes. Well, about that, all that Touch Your Neighbor. Yes. So, so you, that, gotta ask, you gotta ask for consent in we, this climate, we, in we, this climate. We got to say, with permission now, somebody. And if Touch they, your neighbor with consent. Yes, with consent. <laughs> All right. Amen. It don't roll off the tongue quite the same while you're preaching, but I will definitely make every effort to reprogram my brain. Touch your neighbor with consent. All right. The book critiques not just the text yeah. and the history of the kind of hypersexualization and misuse of black female bodies, but as we've been talking just now, you also um, hone in on the church and on, yeah. on black preachers, particularly black male preachers, mm -hmm. and some of whom are you know, friends of mine, they're national uh, voices. And so, uh, you know, uh, let, let's, let's, let, let's, let's, let's hear a little bit of why you think that's so important, number one. And, um, you know, Backlash, pushback, you know, I, I think that's not as important a question for, for me, and I know it ain't for you, um, but I'm, I'm curious about how can we, how can we make this something that black churches, black preachers, particularly male preachers, um, will we'll lean into. And, and maybe that question is unfair to you because that's really about us, right? You talked about the gays and also, you know, I'm, I'm certainly gonna try to start preaching about it and talking about it and, and getting some of this conversation more, but you, you don't let the black church off the hook and I appreciate that. Just talk a little bit, maybe read a couple excerpts about why you felt it was important to, to, to dig into the black church mm -hmm. in this regard. Um, yeah. And, and how, do we, how do we make this a tool of our liberation? Well, I think, well, 
First of all, because I love the black church. Mm. And I feel like you critique those things that you love, Amen. Amen. right? And so you want, because you want to push them to be better. Um, I'm reminded of how a couple weeks ago, many of us were online watching the funeral of Aretha yes. Franklin. And I know all of many of my colleagues are those in my feed, you know, the whole time we were just like, you know, yes and yes, girl, you know, all of that. And we were like, this is why we love the black church, even though all of us critique the black church. Mm. But this is why we love it, right? The culture, this is, this is where our formation happened. This is family, this is our kinship. These are the chosen, when, when, when white folks broke up our family, we created chosen kinships within the church, even though mm. the black church also hurts those kinships, right? And so we were going back and forth and we were celebrating, but at the same time we were like, we understand there's a critique, but we love the black church. And then the eulogy happened. Yeah. And we were quickly off of our high. And we went from, yes, girl, and all of that to, oh my God, like, and literally heartbroken. Again, it wasn't the first time, right? And so, and, and I remember Ebony, Ebony Marshall Terman, and she said, I think, I think it was her, where she said, um, she said, see, she said, unfortunately, we knew this was coming. Mm. We knew in our celebration that this moment was coming at some point, right? And so. And, and that, you, that moment being? The, the eulogy. Okay. And so because you have the eulogy and you have Jasper Williams, who is a celebrated, or he was, because he messed up his legacy that day. He, uh, he's a celebrated pastor. He eulogized her father. And, and we were excited about this. We were excited about this moment of seeing him return to this national stage, even though he's been doing things, but we don't really see him. And so it was like, this is, we were excited because he's going to give us, right? He's going to give us the eulogy. He's going to give us the hoop. That's what we were thinking about. He's going to give us the frenzy that he gave to her father, CL. That's what we were, we were excited about, the frenzy. You know, black folks, we love the frenzy. Yes, Lord. Okay. The, boys, the boy says in uh, Souls of Black Folks, he said, the way that you distinguish between the black church and the white church is that in the black church you have, who knows, the pastor, the music, and the frenzy. That's what makes us different. And we knew I wish that I had he was bringing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we knew he was gonna bring the frenzy. But what we did not check, was his theological content. Yes. We didn't know what he would offer theologically. And what he did is he let us down. Yeah. And so he does this a eulogy that really problematizes Aretha in some very, very harmful ways. And in the process of problematizing her, he problematizes us as black women. I mean, he talks the, mainly the whole time, he talks about basically this kind of Jezebelian figure, this black, who is a black single woman? I mean, this goes, this discourse on black single, uh, not just black single women, but black single mothers, that whole disc, that is the Jezebelian figure, right? She's not a wife. But that whole discourse goes all the way back, right, to uh, early 20th century, like right after slavery. And so the Moynihan Report. And so you have all of this talk, and here he is. And so, it's, and I wrote a post that said, wow, I said, so he's like, he has the Moynihan report, report in one hand, and he had John Singleton in the other one with the whole black woman can't raise sons, and like he ain't read in 20 years. Like, you know, like what, what happened here? And so we were devastated. And ultimately, the, can, can, mm -hmm. he hadn't read in 20 years. Clearly not. That is so he had, you have to keep, you have to keep mm, reading. Yes, there are so many yes. um, discourses by womanists and black feminists and other social scientists who have um, totally contradicted that narrative of black single mothers being like, you know, evil or being holding the black community back, being the sign of racial regress. There's, there's tons of work that's well, what, been done. What I take from that though is you can be progressive in one decade mm -hmm. and stop learning. Yes. And mm -hmm. end up being he was He was the epitome outdated. of that. But he was also the epitome of something that's very true to the black church. The black church is racially pro progressive. But when it comes to sexism, when it comes to sexuality, it is regressive. It is, it is completely behind. And so he was a part, right, of that. And so here he is, and we're having to re-eulogize her. Myself and many others, we came together and we re-eulogized her. For that, because, way. yeah, we were broken. How many, how many saw that? Did, did y'all did see mm -hmm. this? Just say real quick about that, how they can find that, because I did find that to be a very fascinating yeah. tribute. I don't think the church realizes how um, it's rhetorical markings 
right? So the language that it uses, how it not only marks us, but it hurts us, it breaks us down. And so to the point where people, they leave, they leave the church or they come back, but they have sometimes this very strange relationship because of all of the harm that's been done. And so I don't think the church, the church pastors really need to look at, there's a hashtag, a church hurt. Yes. Where people are talking about being hurt by the church. And I don't think that pastors necessarily take that seriously. So I really wanted to get at the black church, this place that I love, um, that I find so much value in, that I can't find anywhere else, right? There's something there that I can't find anywhere else, but there's also this harm there that is just like everywhere else. Mm. And I wanted to turn the tables on that so that you know, people, parents and mothers and fathers, they have a whole different discourse that they can operate within, especially when they have children and when you have nieces. When my niece grows up, I don't want her being sexualized. I want her, her mom, I want, I, I want them to be very clear that what just happened to you Right? That was, that was a pedophilic gaze. The problem is with the gaze, it is not with you. And you are not Jezebel. And actually, this is how we read Jezebel. I want us to have a whole new, you know, language. Because um, language is power. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's, it's also a tool of oppression. So we have to choose which one. Well, we, read, pull, a, okay. pull a passage out about, about the black church that you want to elevate. And, okay. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. So this one's a little bit, it's a little bit long. So, and moving on down the line, this is actually chapter two. And the chapter is titled... Some of y'all will know why when I say. I'll find it real quick for the text. The chapter is titled, These Hoes Ain't Loyal. Who remembers that sermon? <laughs> these Hoes Ain't Loyal. <laughs> yeah. so, so if you're sitting here like, we don't call women hoes. And these hoes ain't loyal. That was in this church. Okay, that was preached. These hoes ain't loyal, which is a refrain from Chris Brown's song. And so um, it's called These Hoes Ain't Loyal, White Perversions, Black Possessions. And what I argue is that these are white perversions, that they came from Europe and the plantation, but then black people began to possess them. And so we began to utilize them and reappropriate them. And so here we have in 21st century, we have Reverend Jamal Bryant um, preaching to a mostly woman congregation. These hoes ain't loyal, which is so fascinating to me, right? Like given his narrative. And so... Um, there's a lot being said in that moment. And to get into that, just, you have to read the chapter. But I look at him and Chris Brown, but then that's also the chapter where I look at the Jezebelian figure and the biblical figure and how, how did they, how what they're saying about black women, how they align. Because let's be honest, when he said these hoes ain't loyal, the women did not get up and walk out, which is what we should be doing. The church went up. It, they it, stood up and clapped. The frenzy you're talking about. At the about. frenzy. And so I even talk about that. Why did they stand up and clap? Because I think they want to be clear. I'm not a hoe. They want to, I'm a lady. So yeah, them, them hoes is loyal. Right? So you want, it's a way of distinguishing between yourself and other women. So here's the excerpt I want to read. It's on page 56. And it says, and moving on down the line, uh, Horton Spillers ponders, if the black church, given its radical quest to address and heal the human condition, and its pursuit of critical self-actualization and truth might be a, a space of exploring and disrupting historically assigned racial and gendered meanings. And so I respond to her question in her essay, and I said, well, it could be. If the black church committed to doing the work of undoing by aggress aggressively, consistently, and unrelentingly maintaining a counter voice to all black di diasporic oppressions. Ooh. If it divested itself of racist and sexist theologies, imaginings, and legitima legitimations. If it seriously attended to the history of physical and sexual trauma affecting black men and women alike, and examined how the fear of each during slavery constructed a need for not only a more rigorously imagined black femininity, but also a patriarchal ideal. If it definitively dispossessed any and all political, rhetorical, and representational iterations of heteronormative, imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist, capitalist patriarchy. If it committed to critical discourses on desire and power rather than erotophobia, repression, and closeting. If it unapologetically engaged and uncovering and healing histories of, of unresolved tensions and antagonisms between black men and women 
and if, they committed to loving all its people the same. Until then, the black church, while an important site of promise, will remain a significant meeting ground of black possessions of, 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 of all of white perversions, however restrained and fragile, or more specifically, it will remain a foundry of historical and contemporary Jezebelian slash whole theologies. Take it easy. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Y'all got to clap it up for that. That was... So the black church needs to do all of those things. So yes, it could be this site, this liberative site. It has the potential, but only if. Only if. Only if mm. we began to accepting all bodies, all flesh, truly. Mm. Right? And, and the, way that, in the ways in which that we show up. Only if we begin doing that. Mm. Only if we stop... Um, repressing sexuality and we begin seeing it as very human mm. to us. Only mm. if we stop closeting sexuality, mm. right, and our sexual, I, sexual uh, embodiment, only if we do that, only if we stop participating in black patriarchy, mm. only if, only if we begin truly loving people as Jesus tells us to love thy neighbor, only if, only if we do those things, then we will see a different black church. <clears throat> Whew. Type it up one more time. Dr. Lomax, I got to tell you. Um, I, you know, I, I remember talking with Pastor Tracy Blackman about um, some of these very conversations. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm making, I have all these connections happening in my mind. But as you read the slave archives, mm -hmm. um, and you were capturing the, the violence perpetrated against women, uh, black female bodies in particular. Pastor Tracy mentioned to me that the untold story of that is the violence perpetrated against black male Absolutely. bodies sexually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how, can, can you imagine this kind of end of say, the problematizing of sexuality or sexual oppression in the black church can it happen without addressing or retelling that story yeah. about the way black men's bodies have been sexually, you know, yes. abused, mutilated, you know, in, in very different ways, but, but still in ways that I think reinforce the kind of patriarchy uh, of conquest versus, yeah. say, vulnerability. Well, that, that's my point in the line where I say that we have to more rigor rigorously, <clears throat> or, well, let me go back. Uh, I said only if we seriously attended to the history of physical and sexual trauma. I'm talking about all of us. Talking about all of yeah, us. Yeah, physical and sexual, affecting black men and women alike and examine how that fear of that trauma, yes. of being castrated, of being raped, and being forced to breed children, right, and, of being seen as being emasculated, mm -hmm. which that's a whole different interesting yes. thing right. because emasculation is seen as just the cutting off of the penis, which says that your masculinity is solely in your penis, which is deeply problematic mm. and trans antagonistic, right? And so, but. So, say that word again. Trans antagonistic. Trans -antagonistic. <laughs> yeah, and so, so that's a whole no, other. Y'all know we, a, got, we got the love learning up in here now. <laughs> that's, that's, a whole, that's a whole other thing, but you have men who are being castrated, but they're, they're also being raped. Not only are they yes. being raped by, you know, the master class, and I, I mean, they're being raped by men and women, right. and they're being prostituted. But there's a writer, and I write about it in here. I have a whole, a couple pages on black male rape during slavery. And um, it was called that's, third, that's in it's, in, it's in here. Yeah, I talk about it. Um, because it's seen as third party rape. The breeding was seen as third party rape. Meaning that they, were, they didn't want to rape the slave women. They didn't want to have, and I say rape because there was no consent. They did not want to do it, right? Unless there was a love relationship. But when you're talking about breeding, most of the time you have, and I have some slave narratives in the book, um, maybe about six or seven, but um, one in particular, there's one who talks about, ask, she's asking the Lord to forgive her because she's like, if this man tries to rape me again, I'm gonna beat him over his head. Like she can't, she doesn't want to do this. It's not something she wants to do. And so when she gets free, she asks the Lord to forgive her for not only those violences, but because she will not have any children, which she believes is mm, kind of a part of her faith to have children. And she says, I'm not having, I'm not gonna replenish the earth because, because of what I experienced. And so these women, did not want to be breeders, but neither did the men. And so that's called third, it's been called third party rape in that the men who are called, they were called night riders, were forced to go into these plantations and just have sex. Well, that was rape too, because they're being forced to do something they didn't want to do. And most of the time they had 
partners back. They had wives. They had people that they loved back somewhere else. And here they are having to, you know, have these relations. And then they would leave. And so after slavery, you have these fathers who have all these children. There's one, I have a slave narrative from a man. And he says, I don't even know how many children I have, maybe 100. Because he had, he had been one of the main bucks. So he, he had been one of the main bucks to have all these children. He doesn't even know who they are, who they, who they are what they look like. And so some of the times the fathers began having relationships with the daughter because they didn't know that these were their offspring. So you have all of that, the incest and all of that. So my point is that there is this whole sexual, poli what I call plantation sexual politics mm. that happened that we have not been healed from. Yes. It is still impacting us to this day. It impacts how we look at black women in terms of their behinds or as sexual objects. It impacts how black men look at themselves. And what I just, part of what I just read is that if we really dealt with the trauma of that, which is a lot of work, if we really dealt with the trauma of that, then we might get underneath why this whole, why black patriarchy, this black patriarchal idea, ideal is so necessary, right? Because men are trying to grasp at this manhood that wasn't given to them. And so they feel like it was taken from them because they were raped, because rape is a woman's thing. But they were raped. So that they feel like that's different than the rape that happened to black women. And so, but no, all the rape was violent and it, it, it messed us up in a variety of ways. So yes, men were definite, men, men and boys. <clears throat> yeah, it, it, it definitely seems to me that not only has it not been dealt with, we haven't even talked Nobody, about it. And there's not even a lot of research on it because no one wants to talk about it. But, but I will say, there's a ton of research on black women in slavery and rape because uh, black women and women, we have been doing that work yeah. to talk about it. We work through it. And so black men, you know, need to get on board and start doing this internal work and stop, you know, Sleeve Harvey and Tyler Perry, stop trying to tell us yeah. what we need to do and who we need to be, right? They need to do that internal work yeah, we, and we, yes, begin yes. looking at self. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, all right, we're we going to open it up for some Q&A in a second. Dr. Cooper, get ready to come and, and offer a reflection. But let me just ask you this one last question. So I'm a pastor. Yes. Oh, oh, you know, and I, how would, what is a recommendation? Because you are, yeah. you're, you're, you're a partner, your husband is a pastor. Um, you're a daughter of the church. How would you even imagine this? being integrated into the life of a church, mm -hmm. knowing that, you know, if the primary place of formation in the black church tends to be a Sunday morning message, yeah. something like this can be perhaps gestured at, but the healing and the trauma probably needs a whole nother setting of mm -hmm. sorts. And, 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 and again, I was talking with, Reverend Dr. Donald Battle, who, um, you know, we were just trying to figure out, like, you know, there is such a dearth of, of quality people who are able to give advice around relationships and healing. And so we do go for the Steve Harveys and these popular culture folks who, Lord knows why they would be an expert on pretty much anything mm -hmm. related to this stuff, right? I mean, not no shade. To, well, maybe a lot of shade. Yeah, yeah, know, no, right? there is shade. Um, so, so I guess, you know, this is really a question uh, from curiosity and of course it's going to be, I think, our, all of our project to figure out how do, we, how do we make this a part of the life of the black church because quite frankly, if this is a unique experience of black people in America, mm -hmm. right. right, then there is not a lot of places where this healing can or will take place mm -hmm. unless we the black church is pivotal to this you know project. pivot to yes. it. you have any thoughts on how how yeah. this could be rolled out is it small groups is it more conference i mean just you know more talks like this what, what's yeah some thoughts? i have the um i have a nice way and then i have the crunk way yeah okay so the nice way thank you is, for the spectrum well, i appreciate this yeah of course <laughs> the nice way is that you know you know of course it would be really helpful to read this work, to read this particular work, to read womanist texts, to read black feminist texts, right? But this one in particular, because it deals specifically with the imagery and black preachers, and it looks at the, it does a close critical reading of sermons. And so black preachers in can, this, in this oh text. yeah, I, I look at um, at least, so I look at, I look at um, Jamal Bryant's one sermon, but then on T.D. Jakes, I look at like four or five sermons and like 14 of his books. 
So, and I do a close reading of each. So, you know, if T.D. Jakes gets mad or whatever, I'm, I'm citing him. These are things that he said, right? And so, um, so, so I do a close critical reading of the, his books and sermons, and then of course films and Tyler Perry. Tyler Perry. And so, but that's helpful in terms of looking at how language is used, how um, mythology is used within a sermonic moment to oppress black women and girls. And so, and to isolate us and really to shame us sexually. We're always kind of the butt, like just being thrown under the bus. And so, um, and, and I even talk about, I spend a lot of talking about, talk, time talking about the good work that some of these sermons do only to cut us down on the back end. Because truth be told, the sermon that Jamal Bryant does, he does a lot of good work in that sermon. Mm -hmm. It's when he gets to these holes ain't loyal and what that means and what, what he's expecting out of certain kinds of women, like that's when he gets to going in an opposite direction because he spends a lot of time talking about women's rights and you know, daughters, and, but only to then cut us down and throw us under the bus. So pastors, the theology starts at the top. And so pastors really need to radicalize their vision and, and to correct their uh, rhetorical framework. And so the language, you've got to look at the language that's being used. So like in examples and, uh, and your sermonic examples, but also how you're reading the text, which is where a woman has come in. You have to be reading one minute's text. How are you not reading, how are you preaching sermons and not reading, you know, what Will Gaffney has to say about, you know, Bathsheba or how, like, and, and, and my husband preach, preaches and he has a, he has, he doesn't call himself a black feminist, but he has a very feminist, very radical lens. And it is, it's very feminist, but he doesn't use that language. And um, when he preaches, he has, he's always thinking about me in the back of his mind as a critic. I Will this upset my wife, right? And so, <laughs> I go but, he's, home, but he's reading the text. He's reading their books. We have a whole library, a whole section on. And so, if he's like, "Yeah, I'm gonna deal with," you know, Ruth today, I'll be like, yeah, "You need to read such, the woman that she got. Um, you know, she needs to read. She she wrote on Ruth. You need to read about what she has to say about Ruth, right?" And so, and, but but Will makes it easy. Will Gaffney and the book that she has, a womanist midrash. Where it's all right there. She's looking at all of the women if in the you, Old Testament. If y'all have not got, th that is a serious. And that is a serious text. Woo, Absolutely. I, I, I have my reading of Jezebel because of my conversations with Will Gaffney. That's the other thing about scholarship is you have to know your lane. I'm a cultural theorist. I'm a, I'm a historian uh, of religion. I'm not a biblical scholar, mm. right? So I had to go to the experts Good. to help me read Jezebel or also help me read how Jakes is reading this text, you know, and Luke. They had to, we had to engage on that. And so Will really helped me with this reading of Jezebel. So one of the ways, is, there has to be a shift in theology and that starts at the top, right? So that's the nice way, reading, getting Jezebel, you know, rereading the text through a womanist, feminist lens. Mm -hmm. I also suggest um, reading, in addition to Jezebel and womanist texts, I uh, organized and curated online at the Black, I don't know if you saw it, um, the Black Theology International Journal. I did a um, special issue, and I can't remember what it's called. Black Bodies in Ecstasy. Mm. Black Women, the Black Church, and something else, can't remember. We'll Google it. Yeah, I know. So, so Brittany wrote for it, and but we have articles where we are dealing with the text, and we are dealing with the text, and we're 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 providing a womanist and black feminist spin on a reading of these texts that we use that we see in the Bible. Carrie Day wrote for it. Ooh, Dr. Carrie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it's tight, right? And so we are doing this reading of texts and of culture and of the black church, and we're saying, no, you're not going to take our sexuality from us. Mm. It's here in the text, yes. right? And so that's another thing. So, so basically, black pastors have to, and I mean women, women and men pastors, because sometimes women can be some of the greatest gatekeepers of patriarchy. And so, um, I mean both, right? And so there has to be this rereading of the text. That's the first thing. That's the nice, nice thing that, that was, comes from that reading. That was a nice thing. It was a nice thing. Now, the more, the more. The more crunk thing is that, and I've said this several times on Facebook, women, when you hear their sermons, I've done it many times. You walk out. You walk out and you take your tithe with you and don't come back. The church cannot exist without black women. You ain't, you ain't lying now. Cannot exist without black women. Walk out, take your tithe with you, and go where you are being loved and affirmed fully. All right, I'm with that. Don't go back. Amen. And, and see what happens when the pastor's up in there. 
Doctor. And giving them two Lincolns and that's it. <laughs> Dr. Tamura Lomax, everybody. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna uh, invite Dr. Brittany Cooper to come and join us on stage. Uh, you know, at this, at this stool. And just, just give her a chance just to offer a quick, uh, I'll give her my mic. No, 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 put it, just put it right there, yeah. And, and just offer a quick, a quick response um, to, to this work. They are, I find this to be the golden age of black women, um, uh, theologians, scholars, authors, daughters, and, 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 and folks who have come out of the black church um, are telling their story, and it is helping me. It is blessing me, and I'm just glad they acknowledge me from time to time when they see me and don't run the other way. Doc, Dr. Cooper, what would you say just as response to what you've heard in this text? Um, what's up, everybody? Um, so my only job, only thing I'm going to say is that I'm on stage to be a hype man for my girl. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I'm so proud of you. We've come a long way we since 2004. Yes, we, we, uh, we met in a graduate seminar in 2004 yeah. at Emory. Um, and so mostly, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, did not our hearts burn within? Mm. Right? Um, you brought fire. Um, and um, my sense is that this is a blueprint for liberation, if we'll take it seriously. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the thing that I hope that Dr. Lomax embodies is we're children of the church too, mm -hmm. right? And, and very often when we think about what the church can be and we think about its sense of possibility, we see it as a recalcitrant space. Um, we can be in the church and be like Jasper Williams mm -hmm. um, and be 20 years behind in our thinking about what is possible in the church. Mm -hmm. Not recognizing that, yeah, there's some, some women who came up in church and who towed the line um, and who have tried to become these acceptable church ladies. And then there are some of us who grew up in church and have become rogue, but still love mm -hmm. Jesus, mm -hmm. right? And, um, <laughs> and so Dr. Lomax embodies that, the, the sort of critical possibility of, of, of the daughters that the church was raising. And one of the reasons it's important to say that we're children of the church too is because sometimes we have an anti-intellectual strain in yes. churches yes. where we're afraid that folks will turn off if the words are too big mm -hmm. or the concepts are too tough. Mm -hmm. But y'all know when y'all read that King James Version of the Bible, y'all don't know what people be talking about. <laughs> and you have to pull out all these commentaries. <laughs> And stuff, and uh, you know, be, well, what they mean, but you know, concupiscence. I mean, all language and stuff, Doubt. right? You just be like, what is this? And so the idea that we are not equipped as a people to grapple because the text is hard, yes. the text that brings us together is hard, yes. right? Um, the Jesus that we love is is hard. He's yes. Wonderful and also hard. Jesus was always confounding people. You know, you must, you know, you must be born again. Nicodemus is like, what you, uh, what you mean? <laughs> right, I don't, what do you mean, Jesus? Right, and so the idea, we have been trained in the work of grappling with hard text. That is endemic to our DNA. And so as you listen to this sister, put it down. And she's serious. Um, and this, you know, I've read the intro to this text. I got an early copy because, you know, I, I'm in the in a circle. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I was about to say a cuss word. Come on now. <laughs> yes, right? And so what I want to say to you is that this book will bless your life, that it will help you make critical connections, that ain't no shame in pulling out your dictionary and sitting with a paragraph for a few days. Um, mm -hmm. And that part of what, um, womanist theology and black feminist theology teach us is that there are other sacred texts and so sometimes when the Lord gets to you and speak a verse to you you have to sit with it for a few days mm -hmm. nothing wrong with sitting with this text for a while mm -hmm. and letting it open up to you mm -hmm. and so thank you sis thank you. this is a blessing yes. um, and I'm blessed to be here yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Dr. Brittany Cooper thank you so much I have to say, I have to say this about Brittany and, um, and she, she knows this. 
So when we, were, when we were in graduate school, she was in a PhD program. I was still in a master's program trying to get into a PhD program. And we had this class together, which was a PhD class. Selling a body. Selling a body. And um, I had never seen a black radical uh, feminist embodiment in my life that was hers. The fire, like she, they started the crunk feminist. And the fire that she brought in the classroom, I remember watching, even though I'm older than you, I remember watching it in awe. And this was, this was back in 2004. And um, it was you and Yolande. And um, their way of navigating, and I remember thinking, because y'all introduced me to Joan Morgan's Chick When Chicken Heads Come Home to Roost. And I said, even though I'm older, I said, I want to be, I want my feminism on the black church to be like that. I want it to be crunk like that. Right? I don't want to be respectable with it. Right? I, want it, I want it to be embodied in a way that the folks not only hear it, but they feel it. Right? And so that's important to note that those, all those years, oh, over a decade, over a decade ago, and neither one of us were feminists yet. I don't know. <laughs> we were struggling with it. But, um, but yeah, it was, it was me watching her in the classroom and just really being in awe of that embodiment. And so some of my fight that you see it's, I saw her fight first. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and, and, and that's the iron sharpening iron mm -hmm. dynamic, right? And th this, is, this is the important uh, gift of community, not just in the large gatherings, but even in these kinds of, um, you know, intimate or one-on-one -on -one or smaller gatherings that we make one another better. Yeah. And what I love about all of y'all, none of y'all hate on each other. Y'all lift each other up, and it is, uh, it is a gift. And I'm... Yeah. I, and I get to see them a little bit behind the scenes too, so they really like each other. Praise God! It's not no, <laughs> it's not no act, and that's a blessing. So we have a microphone, um, and and uh, why don't we, you know, Patrick, do you mind putting that mic right here in the center so folks can just kind of line up and, and ask some, some questions? Um, uh, so uh, take it a little bit further back, just a little bit further back. Boom! That's good right there. Um, let's let's hear some questions. Uh, what what kind of questions do folks have? I know one question that you're going to like is, where can I purchase this book? <laughs> <laughs> so tell people how they can get access to this book, because it is already sold out. It is sold out. I, um, I was trying to get 100 some copies, and it was already sold out from the publisher, Touch Your Neighbor. So she's off, <laughs> she's off with consent. Yeah. <laughs> so it's... Um, to answer the question uh, quickly, it's, you can get it on Amazon. It sold out on Amazon, and then it sold out at Duke as well. Um, so academic books, they have a first printing where they you know, will print a certain number of books. And they, you know, they feel like that's, if you, we were talking in the office, if you, if you sell an academic book, if you sell 500, you're good. For some reason, Duke's actually made more than that, thinking that we'll be good. You know, they knew that it had a public presence, and so they sold out of that, Duke and Amazon. Um, so clap it up for that, y'all. That is not a small thing. That yeah. Is yeah. Way to come out the gate. Yeah. So it. now it's in the second printing, and Duke is doing their second printing, but that takes a minute, unfortunately. Um, so that's going to be a couple of weeks. However, what they did because of the desire for the book is they actually they don't typically do this, but they sent Amazon the files so that Amazon can now, when they run out of their stock, they can print their own books and not have to depend on Duke, and they can do it quicker. Than do can so you can still order right now through Amazon. Now, what 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 is the best place to order for your purposes? Either one doesn't. Matter. Either one of those, I okay. still benefit, and I like to watch Amazon. Well, they they all keep the numbers. I like to watch Amazon because Amazon keeps kind of like the ranking, okay. and um, you know I do care about numbers too. We so. all do. We <laughs> all do because yeah. keep it real. And Dr. Cooper tested this. The more successful you are, you are at this topic and conversation the easier it is for the next round of text like yeah. this to be published, yes. correct? Yes. Because publishing yes. houses look at the um, appetite Ab for this absolutely. Kind of material. So absolutely. the fact that it's sold out already, hopefully it makes it easier for the next group of writers and authors that I see <laughs> sitting around here. To, amen. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> that, that it'll be easier for them. All right. So um, qu come on. I, I, the, who, who would like to ask a question? That was one of the things that... Um, uh, was 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 um, 
raised online was where can they find the book? But I have a couple other things, but come on, let's let's introduce yourself, tell us where you're from and what is your question. Oh, um, I live here in California. I'm from the East Coast. My name is Doc, you can't hear me? Oh, yeah, there we go. Uh, Reverend Sandra Juanita Cooper. Amen. And um, I have a comment first and then the question. Comment is, um, I understand where you're coming from when you were 11 and that, that story that you told, it, it longed heavily for me because my daughter, it wasn't me, it was my daughter. Mm -hmm. We came from the East Coast, I moved to San Mateo because I, didn't, I wanted them, my children to be in an environment where they can go out and play, blah, blah, blah. Well, she was there, we, got, we came out here when she was two and by the time she was uh, 11, 12, she came in the house and she had been, you know, culturized white. And you know, I was culturalized black. And then I, my eyes opened. I looked at my daughter. She threw her little hair back and, Mom, oh, you know what I'm going to do? I, oh my God. And I just stopped. And I said, oh, wait a minute. I hated people like you. We're moving. <laughs> she said, what do you mean? I said, oh no, I grew up with girls like you. You don't even know how to be black. I said, did you ever jump rope? She said, what do you mean? No, why? I, I said, oh, you never braided another black girl's hair? Mom, come on, we're moving. So I took her out of San Mateo, brought her over here, and put her in a black, all black, all black uh, Catholic school so that she could learn how to pray here. So I understand what you're saying, and I'm glad I did that because I saw a person that I wouldn't have liked as an adult. That was, so thank you for that. And um, my question is, both of you talked about this and you pointed to the idea of where do we go from this with this information, right? And so what I envision is we need to pass this on amongst ourselves and amongst everyone else mm -hmm. who view us in this way that is so embedded from slavery and beyond. So I envision, and you tell me what you think, and this is a question, um, I envision us having these meetings in these churches yes. and that we have, if it's a book club, if, if we want to bring a psychologist in or a social worker in and we read and we read a subject and we write about it and we talk about it so it can go in and pull that nasty stuff out mm -hmm. and get, because we, we can't take something out without putting something back in. Mm -hmm. Great, so let, what, what do you think about this idea? Sorry to cut you off, but we don't No, no, I'm ready, I'm ready. Come on, let's get some more questions. This idea of our houses of worship becoming more than just a Sunday experience, but also a place of gathering for these kinds of Absolutely. important conversations. What, yeah. what, what are your thoughts on oh, that? Oh, I think, you know, back in the day, Christian education was a lot of things. It wasn't just Sunday school. It wasn't just Bible study. There were gatherings, right? Hush Harbor was, was a gathering, right? So it was a gathering of people for particular kinds of purposes. And so I think that there needs to be a return to these gatherings where we do read other kinds of texts. You know, I always say that one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century for me was James Baldwin, you know? And so how are we not reading these other texts? And he's, he's talking about his, his he's t he talks about his faith and how he sees that. He talks about uh, white theology and how he sees that. And so he has this wrestling. And so we become so limited where it's like, well, if it doesn't come from the publishing house of my church or my denomination, well, sometimes their theology is work, but also they're limited, right? And so that goes kind of back to what, uh, Dr. Cooper was talking about was this anti-intellectualism. And so there's this pushing back or this uh, moving away from the intellectual discourses that are happening in the black academy. And not just amongst, the, amongst those who are in religion, but even those who are in other departments where we're taking up religion and we're trying to, to have these discussions. So we need more back and forth because we're not just showing up as members, yeah. right? Yeah. We are also showing up as critics. We're showing up as researchers and we're bringing all of that. And so it's good for us, I think it would be good for us to go back to kind of having these hush harbors where we get together and we talk about these other issues as well, the same way that we do social justice, that we be begin talking about other things. Let's talk about language, let's talk about women and girls, let's talk about church hurt, let's talk about sexual violence within the church, let's talk about homophobia in the church. Let's have these groups and let's read these people, not just, you know, in addition to, we can look at the Bible, but then let's also look at those who are, um, who have done work, let's look at the biblical scholars, the, the black ones specifically, let's look at what, they're, what they have to say about these text and let's, let's engage on that. Let's, and it doesn't have to be in the church. I'm a big proponent of, well, let's meet in the coffee house. Let's meet somewhere outside because I feel like we can be freer and honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
one of the things especially if you want to be cussing and uh, yeah and then you know sometimes that happens and so one of the things that i say is that you know we need to get to a point where we are not only honest bodies, but we're honest bodies willing to have honest talk about how we experience this world in the church. Yeah. And so we're not there yet, yeah. where we're even honest with ourselves about who we are, right? And so we're not honest about who are, with ourselves about who we are, so we're not honest within the church. And so we, we keep those other narratives of respectability alive, and we don't have real conversations. But I feel like to have real conversations, sometimes we need to step outside of the walls of the church. And, be, and, and Jesus is there, too. He's, you know. Yes, Jesus is he's, there. He's and, there. And, and I'll just flag, I, I know this is going to be a tension for a lot of pastors, is that it does up in the power dynamic. It absolutely does. You know, mm -hmm. when you do have a learned congregation, or absolutely. a congregation who is spending their life, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. un uncovering and, and nuancing. Mm -hmm. So I'll just make a, 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 a plea and an acknowledgement to black pastors, particularly black male pastors. Um, this will free your congregation. It will. You know, it, and it it'll will. free them. It'll free, it'll, it will free, mm -hmm. free us, but some of us don't want to be free. And well, so that's, but that's I guarantee other. you, most people who come to church are coming because they want to be free. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so if we're serious about people's freedom, then it does make so much sense to allow other voices That's right. you know, to, to help in this regard. And it doesn't mean it won't get messy, you know, because it, it will. But what place of life do you have without messiness? But it's, it's, I'm so glad you said you mentioned messy because one of the under lying theories in the book is what I call the gray, what Joe jo Morgan calls the gray, but it's also what another scholar calls the messy, the ugly. And so we really got to get into this gray, ugly, messy space because that's what's honest. And so in the beginning of the book, I talk about not wanting to be sexualized, right? Not in the church and not in uh, my high school, but I love the ghetto boys in college. So me and my girls, you know, we had this what we call freedom space, where in, but we only dance to the ghetto boys and the privacy of our rooms. Oh, you, you, yes, yes, honey. So she, yeah. <laughs> yes, I forgot you were right there. Yes, yeah, so that's my girl from college. We had this space. She remembers where <laughs> we would dance to all kinds of raunchy music. But don't be at a party and that same music be on and you calling us all kinds of bees and hoes. Yeah. We gonna call you out, we righteous now. But in that space we were free and we enjoy. So what is going on, that's the messy, yeah. right? The messy is to be honest about, yeah, I was dancing to Dr. Dre's Chronic, right? And we just think about the music on Dr. Dre's Chronic. I was dancing to all of that, but I don't like being called this when I'm in the, so what's happening there? So that's the messy, but that's, but it's in that messy space is where we get to honesty yes. and what's going on. And the book does distinguish between what's happening because it's not the same, it's not the same kind of signification. Yeah. 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 Um, all right, come, come, I, I see another question. Someone's asking, will you be touring, speaking with your book across the country to sell and talk about your book? You already posted something, but talk about Mm -hmm. um, the, the date you already may have, or how can people get you to their city, to their church, to their coffee house, et cetera? Um, okay, yeah, so this is really a really interesting time for me because I, I am touring and I do have several dates, um, but I'm, I'm like a, I'm, I'm shy. I, I know it's probably, but like I am not one who's to be out in, so this is very, it's taking me out of my comfort zone. And so it's very hard to, to accept, access me on the web. You can't really. So you have to know me or you have to know someone who knows me to, to stuff, yeah, like, yeah, I, I am. So, so I'm very present on Facebook, but I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on anything else. And so the best way to get through me is to go through um, either the Feminist Wire, where the bios are, and I have my contact there. What's the, what's the, what's the website? The Feminist Wire, www.thefeministwire.com. If you go to uh, bios at the top then my bio is at the top of that. And then at the un underneath my bio is an email where you can get to me. But I'm not like really accessible online. But I, I do have, um, I have several dates lined up and I don't remember them all. And, and so I had only two and 2000, well, I think three more. And 2018 and then several in 2000. 
19. Now, I, I'm, I'm going to do this. I don't know how this is going to play. So if you just be like, McBride, be quiet. But Jamal Bride's a friend of mine. Mm-hmm. Would you sit down with Jamal and do a reading of this yeah, text? Yeah, absolutely. Or network? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I don't write. So that's the thing about me, right? So I am I'm a writer. I'm a researcher. Um, but I'm not, um, and I, I say in the book, I say in the beginning, this is the iconoclastic reading of the black church. Even though I love the black church, it is nothing is off limit. Everything is up that's for right. a good read. That's right. And so that's including the things that we love and the people that we love and the people that make us clap our hands. And so, you know, I don't, I don't know uh, Jamal Bryant, but I wrote the book with the intention of one day having, having or them reading the book or hearing about the book. And so I didn't write it where it's like, oh my gosh, there he is. He's, no, 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 I want him to read this. I want Jakes to read this. I want uh, Tyler Perry to read this. And then so, yeah, I'm not, uh, as, what's Brittany say? I ain't never scared. I'm not, I ain't never scared of having no conversation. Well, uh, yeah, and, I, and I, I'm not essentially suggesting that you're yeah. scared. But I do know, you know, that... Um, mm -hmm. If I think it would be helpful. I, so I mm -hmm. think at some point we have to figure out how we bring these contradictions into conversation with each other and, and correct some of these wrongs. Yeah. And, and so I'm putting you on the spot, Jamal, that we got to arrange yeah. you and Dr. Lomax to have a conversation about this book Mm -hmm. On your platforms, I know Jamal will be up for it. Or you, you think know, so? We, oh, of course. Okay, yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. Jamal, Jamal will. Yeah, yeah. And and because I think it would be, I think it would be helpful. Okay. I really do. I think it'd be helpful for him, for the audiences that he influences. I think it would be helpful for the all of the work that we are all trying to do collectively to address these issues of patriarchy, misogyny, homophobia, transphobia, all human hierarchy. And mm -hmm. so. That's yes. my commitment to you. I'm going to make yes. sure that happens. Absolutely. And, uh, I, and I can't wait to be on the front row for that conversation because <laughs> it's going to be some fire. <laughs> oh, my God. It's some fire. Hello. My name is Yolanda. I'm from California. And my question is, is that when I saw Jezebel Unhinged, I was excited. I was like, ooh, she's about to tear this up, and I'm about to be excited. But my question, two questions. One is, I see those books on the table. Are any of those for sale? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, yes okay. we have we have books here for sale today, um, and uh, you will be at True Vine Ministries with Pastor Zach Carey tomorrow, tomorrow at mm -hmm. nine. Is it nine a.m.? I don't it? know yet. Yeah, I don't remember. Yeah, I think it's nine a.m. and they'll have some limited books for sale there. So uh, certainly, everyone that's here, we should have enough for everybody to pay for a book <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> and allow her to sign it. Um, so hold fast, give us about probably 10 more minutes of Q&A, and then we'll get to the book signing part. But yes, there are books here. Okay, and now my second question is, as a mom, um, just listening to your story and my story and my daughter, the way my daughter is built, you know, she's, She's built, amen. And I don't want to be that parent to make her feel mm -hmm. like she's being sexualized. Because I do uh, find myself telling her, you need to cover, mm -hmm. you know. And my daughter, she started to do it um, just automatically. But I remember taking her to the snowball and how the kids were dressed and how she was dressed. It was very conservative. And she was like, well, it's okay, mom, but... I feel like, you know, it is a little conservative of the way I'm dressing. So I want to know as a parent is how do you approach that subject to her where I don't want her to feel like um, that everybody is going to sexualize her, but I do want her to understand her body, be, you know, to live free in her body, but yet mm -hmm. and still understand the dangers that are out there. Mm -hmm. Do you, you know what I'm saying? I don't Absolutely. know if I'm saying that right. Yeah. Um, I think you have to, so there's a difference between um, covering and shaming, right? And so I think that, um, first of all, the whole covering is gendered, right? Because I live in a household of men and boys, and they walk around all the time with no shirts on. And so, but as a black feminist, I would not be a black feminist mother without calling out the fact that I'm about to walk around with also no shirt on. Just to say, like, I'm not going to do that, but just to say to them that there's an, there's a, there's, this isn't balanced. Right, that they are allowed to just walk around with no shirts, but I am not. And, and that's, so that's a point of conversation. That's a way of entering into con conversation about these double standards. Why is it that mom can't walk around immediately 
you know, one way to freak teenage boys out is to talk about their mother's bodies or like any kind of sexualized way. Like, even though that sex is on their mind all the time, they do not want to think about it in terms of their mother. And so that's a way though to enter into conversation about, you know, the fact that you're having, she's having to cover up something that boys her age do not, but at the same time, um, folks aren't walking around naked, right? So there is, uh, th there is a necessity of covering, but there's a way of talking about covering without shaming her about her body right. or sexualizing her even yourself because of how you think other people will look at her. And there's a way of making her, affirming her body and problematizing those who will try to sexually shame her or try to uh, sexualize her. So you have to make those nuances, right, in your conversation with her. But the first thing is to affirm her body. She is wonderfully made. Yes. No matter what, whatever, however she's developed. You know, we always have this thing with, oh, well, they're just too developed, and it's too, too, too developed for who? Because right. that's always about a who, right? It's not, a, they're too, too developed for what? They're fine. And that's what I wish, we need to get to a point where we're telling our daughters more that you are okay. Because so many of us grow up thinking that we're not. Yeah. Probably the majority of us, yeah. for some reason. Too big, you know, um, buttocks not big enough or uh, too something. We're always, not, there's, we're always too much something. And that a lot of time c comes from the home. Yeah. And so we have, to, we have to shift the narrative where we are affirming the body. Yeah. Yeah. A healthy body, beautiful, beautiful body, whatever the body looks like. Right. Right, and so that's not the same of saying that's not the same as saying. Well, in our cultural context, people do wear shirts, and you have to wear a shirt, right? So that's different. But if it's hot, like why she? I I'll never forget when Biggie Smalls. I love Biggie, um, and I remember when D Biggie he was doing like a TV interview back in the day, the rapper, and uh, came down, came out in like a tank top, and they were like, "You wearing that, right?" Because they were trying to shame him because he's like, "What is hot?" I mean, that's exactly the same thing. <laughs> Right? Like, why does he's like, why do I have, you having a tank, your shirt is off, why, why I gotta be covered up? Oh, you getting all this today. Right? And so we have to teach our daughters that they, they also have the freedom to, if it's hot, why they gotta be, why do they have to be in a turtleneck? Nobody else is at the beach in a turtleneck. You know, because they have breasts. No, I think that, and that's a way of making them ashamed and, and not disliking their bodies, right? So you want them to love their bodies. So you have to find that balance. Yeah, I, you know, speak, speaking of the balance, you know, um, I, I, one of the most difficult things this week or last couple weeks with Dr. Floyd's testimony mm. was hearing her say, this brought me to tears actually because I was thinking of my daughter who, you know, growing up a pastor's kid can be very hard, you know, mm -hmm. trying to make sure your kids don't have to carry an unnecessary burden. Um, but when she said that she never told anyone because, um, you know, she was thinking, I probably shouldn't have been there, probably shouldn't have been drinking, mm -hmm. maybe I did something to, to bring this on myself. Yeah. And I just began to think about my daughters who, you know, or me when I was growing up, how sneaky I was, and how there's certain things my parents probably still don't know I did. Mm -hmm. But how when we don't figure out ways to appropriately <coughs> distinguish between shaming and covering or just between honesty and, and, and shame or just all, all these different things, um, it, it does create a whole nother problem that may be worse than the problem you are immediately attempting Absolutely. to try to fend off, right? Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and so I, I am curious, um, you know, just even as a father, I'm, I'm, my daughter is nine years old and she loves Cardi B to, and I don't understand why. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't like Cardi B. Mm -hmm. My wife don't like Cardi B, but I guess, you know, she's nine and we. She's, she's the voice of their the voice generation. Of their generation. Mm -hmm. But there's so many things that to me are problematic about a Cardi mm -hmm. B mm -hmm. um, that is not just about her, her hypersexualization, or at least how it's commodified and appeared, but it, it also seems to, to create a whole nother kind of persona that I am worried about my daughter taking mm -hmm. on. So, you know, I think for a lot of us who are parents, particularly fathers, you know, this conversation scares us a lot mm -hmm. because we can see the value of it and the importance of it on one side, but then like there's this kind of part of my brain that's like, I don't want anything to happen to my daughter because of that gaze. Because that gaze is going to be there when I'm not there, or that pervert, or that predator, and all, you know all these different things. 
you know, I'm, I'm always curious, and again, just to hear you say, how, how, how would you advise fathers or parents who are, who are trying to make sure our children are not being shamed or, you know, having to carry a burden, but also realize, man, this world is, this world is ugly and predatory. Mm -hmm. You know, just helping, again, to nuance and distinguish yeah. that a little bit, because I would never want to um, create, recreate that 11-year-old or 14-year-old experience you've had, mm -hmm. but realizing that that experience may come regardless of what she's wearing. Well, even just with something that you said, the issue isn't Cardi B, the issue is with the gays. And so that's where the work lies, is with the gays, right? And so the male gays, because Cardi B ain't out here raping folks, right? So she's not, she's not killing folks, you know, because they wanted to break up with her. That's, that, that's, that's men's work, right? So there's that, there's that distinction. But the other thing is but that- until men get that work- How do you protect your daughter? I'm, I'm worried about the protection of my daughter. Of course, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, I, I, we're gonna be doing the men's work as much as I possibly can, but we got a long way to go, admittedly, with men. Um, and so, again, I, I was talking with another man, I don't, I don't mean to belabor this point too much, but I was talking with another guy about how how when we were growing up, our experimentation with girls, we probably would not remember because it was not that significant to us. But for some girls, they carry that with them their whole life. I think we all carry it though. I don't, I, I think that there, and I think Issa Rae in Insecure is teaching us that in the same way uh, women are emotional, men are emotional, and the same way that uh, women have multiple, uh, men have multiple sexual partners, sometimes women have multiple sexual partners, and the same way that uh, men desire, women desire. So I think there's, um, we wanna be careful about suggesting that, oh, well, it was different for us. It was meaning, meaningful or meaningless for us. I think for some women, sometimes it's meaningful, sometimes it's not, right? And so it's not different in that way, but I wanna get back to the music. And I think we have to give our daughters more credit, right? Just think about the music that we listen to, right? And I, I remember um, when we were gangster rap and all that, I was kind of like, well, are you gonna become a gangster? I'm like, no, I just like the beat, you know? <laughs> like it's just, you know, we can drop it while it's hot. When the beat comes on, it's not even about like really what's being said, right? And so we have to make that distinction and trust our kids enough, number one, to allow them to invite us into conversation. So um, when I was coming up, my brother can remember this. I had, and my sister, I had a, a whole bag of cassette tapes. And, um, but I would hide them. Because I did not want, my father was a pastor, I did not want him to know all the raunchy stuff I was listening to. Did you know about it? He didn't know about it. But uh, my brother knew about it. <laughs> my sister knew about it. And um, we had all the hip hop tapes. Because, you know, that's when hip hop was first coming on the scene. And so you got Latoya, and that was like, I was curious about this Latoya they talking about. Who remembers Latoya? Because that's like aging me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, Latoya. So Latoya, like that was one of the first kind of like raunchy, like you know, hip hop. And so, like, but I liked, I loved hip hop. So I had this, and I remember my dad hearing like one tape, and I'm saying, you know, that's, you know, that's wrong. And so I was like, well, these, about, I'm not throwing them away. They got, they about to be hidden under the bed, you know. But. Listening, we have to trust our children enough to know that they're not becoming what they're listening to. I mean, what was our parents listening to? Papa was a Rolling Stone. Are you a Rolling Stone? Y'all were listening to stuff too, right? And so we're listening to the music that moves us for whatever reason, and we have to trust our children to listen to the music that moves them for whatever reason. So for me and our household, now we have two sons. We have two sons, and they are 17 and 16. And our thing has always been that we allow them to listen to the music freely, but we have to engage it. Because to me, it's an entry point to talking, to talking about bodies and respect and consent and autonomy and patriarchy. And, and, and hip-hop in particular, I'll never forget my son and I, we were on campus at VCU, and uh, there was like a musical, there was a flyer for a party, hip-hop flyer, and um, he was maybe 13. And um, we were walking on campus, and he was like, oh my gosh, mom, he's like, party flyer. He had a woman with big boobs, and the heads were cut off. And he was like, I saw that flyer. He was like, um, I really want to go back and see it. He was like, can I go back and see it? Can I go back and see that? Because I felt something when I saw that. And so many parents would say, no, that's you know, terrible. I said, yeah, let's go back and see it. So we go back to the flyer, and we look at it. And so for me, it's, I let him have his moment, you know, little boy moment. 
And then I'm like, okay, but let's talk about the flyer. Because to me, it was an opening to talk about feminism. Because I'm like, where are the heads on the women? Why do we only see breasts here? Why do we only see behinds? Like, what's, what's happening here? These women are being sexualized. And that's the difference from being sexual. They're being sexualized. So what's happening here? This is, this is objectifying to them. And so he's kind of like, and this is how I talk to my son, with this, this language. And so to bring it home, I said, well, how would you feel if this is a picture of mommy? Right? And so, of course, he's like, ugh. But it was also like, there was a, uh, I don't like, they, so it wasn't, I don't like the boobs. It was, they should have heads. <laughs> they should be, right? But still, that's where I'm trying to get, I'm trying to see their, him to see their humanity. So it's not cutting off the music. It's, we're going to listen to the music. I would, we, our boys play sports. We drive them all over. We go on these road trips. And I'd have it, and, we, and so they would listen to our music, then we listen to their music. And many parents don't want to do that. Because their music is even more raunchy than ours. And, but I have a rule. I said, now, for every two of yours, we got to listen to four of mine, because I can only do so many, you know. I can't, I can't take too many of this column M and B's, and, you know, like, and, like, we can do two, and then we're going to go to mine, and we go to yours, and then we're going to discuss, though. But at this point, we don't, I don't even need to be. They have a feminist lens already. So for me, it's an opportunity, not cutting off culture, because they're going to find, they're going to find a way to put it under the bed, and they're going to still try to listen to it. And then we mystify it. We demystify it by not even making it a big, a big deal. It's just an opening to talk right, about so, life. So your next book's going to be on parenting. I, it I, is. I, all right. It is on parenting. I know. Yeah. It's a shameless plug, but yeah. it is. Yes. Thank you. Hi, I'm Hi. 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 <laughs> Dr. Lomax. Okay, so you actually touched on this. As a newlywed womanist who's straight, I don't have a lot of role models for black feminism and womanism. I feel like a lot of us are in the same gender or queer relationships, which is fine, but I'm not queer. So how do you reconcile your black feminist politic with what could be considered like a stereotypical traditional marriage? Mm, yeah. So I really deal with that in the newest book, um, which um, that's, it's going to take a while, but it's called uh, Raising Non-Toxic Sons in White Supremacist America. And in that book, I really talk about what it means to, be, to, to do black feminist mothering as a woman who is married, right? And so I look at um, patriarchy, and I have a whole chapter actually called Leaving the Patriarchy. And I talk about how when my sons were first born, um, I was very patriarchal. I was a gatekeeper. I want to be like Claire. Right? I want to be, you know, it, it was my husband who said, I don't want this from you. I, want, I, I was a stay-at-home mom. I stopped working. And part of why I stopped working was not because um, that's what women do. It was kind of, um, we, I went back to work. I tried it out. And I was fortunate enough to have a household where I didn't have to work. He tried it also. And so we did, we had that balance. But it was ultimately me staying home with the boys and, and staying home, I thought, well, I'm supposed to live in a certain kind of identity. I'm, going to, I'm supposed to live into that. And I'm supposed to make dinner before you come home. I'm supposed to get dressed up, right? When you walk in the door, so dinner is, well, if you know me, you know I hate cooking. <laughs> like I detest it with a passion. I love my babies though. Like those are, those are my babies, those are my heart. But like everything else needs to be outsourced. We need a house, Somebody, somebody's gonna need to clean the house. I'm not gonna be cleaning the house. So. So you got making it, you guys. So I am not traditional in that way, even though I'm in a heterosexual marriage, right? And so, so it's not like. But in the beginning, I thought I'm supposed to be in this box, and it was my husband who said I had tried it for a week, and it was a mess. The dinner was probably nasty, and um, he didn't say it, but he pulled me to the side and he said, "Why are you doing this?" And I said, "Well, is this what I'm supposed to do? Because I'm at home." And he says, "No, you're only supposed to do what you want to do, whatever that is." If whatever that is, whatever you want to do is what you're supposed to be doing. He's like, I don't want you cooking for me. He was like, I cook my own food. I don't want you. So it's him that freed me up from that box that I thought a uh, lady is supposed to be. And so it was also him that said, he said, I had a dream. I had a vision. I really feel like you're supposed to go to seminary, which is where I got liberated. And um, I said, well, I'm trying to go back to school. But he went, got, this is before the internet. So he went, he went and got the application. He went to our pastor. People don't know this. He went to our pastor, and he came to me, and he said, babe, I have your application and your recommendation. You need to fill this out. And so that was his doing. And so it was our partnership, right? And, and I always say that he's, he's, he's a feminist father in many ways, but it was our partnership 
that really helped to liberate me from that box of what I thought a wife was supposed to be. So yes, I am heterosexual, I am in this marriage, but to really know me is to know that I operate as a feminist within that marriage. And so even the whole idea of where we talk about households and heads, I'm like, as Renita Weems said, we both, we both have a head. We both have heads, like we both, we are partners in our household, and so we lead our household in that way. Now, are there moments where he needs to step up and lead? Are there moments where I need to step up and lead? Absolutely. Do we respect one another? Absolutely, 2,000%, 2, right? And so I think we have to reimagine how we partner with the people that we love, and so and we have to reimagine um, black heterosexual families, because one of the things I do critique, it's my last point, last point, in the newest book is that in order to make room, a lot of times, in order to make room for same gender loving uh, or trans families, we have to problematize heterosexual families. And I have a problem with that. I feel like we should be able to make room for all kinds of kinships just as they were, was in slavery, right? And before, before, before slavery, we, we should be able to make room for all kinds of kinships, right? Which includes the black uh, heterosexual family, but the black heterosexual family not being this iconic figure that represents, you know, black racial progress, right? So that cannot be, but we don't have to diss, you know, the black heterosexual family in order to say that, you know, being partnered up is cool, right? That's, to me, that's a whole other form of oppression. And so we need to be honest about that. And I don't feel like we're at a point yet where we're honest about that. But yeah, so it, it, it's, I, I feel like there has to be a rethinking, a reimagining re of what that role looks like, but we have to embody it and communicate it. And if you ever saw my husband and I in person, you would see that. Like there's a great respect and love for one another, but it is not rooted in patriarchy. It's rooted in mutuality and it's rooted in our humanity. It's rooted in our respect for one another. But at the heart of the respect for one another is a sense of mutuality. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think we're gonna wrap there. Um, any last words? What, 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 if, if this is successful beyond your wildest dreams, what contribution do you think it will have in the church, in the culture, among families? Just a few words. Yeah. Some closing, closing thoughts to all of us. I'm certainly, we're going to make this the next book in our yeah. ah. way, The Ways uh, book series. So um, hurry up and get them reprints going because we're going to get at least 100 of them up in yes. here. To touch your name. Touch your name. Um, with with sense. Sense. <laughs> um, I'm often asked this question, you know, what do you want Jezebel to do? And when I was writing Jezebel, there are a couple of things that I desire. One is I want to see a cultural shift. Right? So I want to see a cultural shift in terms of how we look at black girls. I want to see a cultural shift in terms of a theological shift within the black church and how we articulate black womanhood, black femininity, and black, sex black female sexuality. Um, but then the other piece is that Jezebel is a very academic book. And so when I first began writing Jezebel, um, I wasn't writing it for the black church. I was writing it for academia. I was writing it for tenure. And so, what, so, so there's that piece, right? So I wanted to do this uh, social cultural work where we see this cultural shift, right? But on, at the same time, I wanna see it um, changing how we articulate black womanhood and black, black femaleness and sexuality um, and all of that. I wanna see that shift the academic realm. And so Jezebel Unhinged, one of the things that it does, and when you read it, you may be like, well, she's talking about Jezebel, but she's also critiquing this discourse, and she's talking about, and she's bringing in all these readings. It's because, as an academic text, you have to make room for yourself. And so what Jezebel does is it creates a whole, just like uh, John Morgan created uh, black, uh, 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 hip hop feminism, you have um, Jacqueline Grant created Womanist Thought, and this book, Jezebel is historic, in that Jezebel creates this black feminist uh, study of religion. And so it is, it's, creating a cultural shift, but it's also creating this intellectual shift, this methodological shift. And so what I want to see is I want to see a whole bunch of uh, new folks and religion, studying religion, but studying it under a black feminist, a black feminist thought, a black feminist uh, study of religion, specifically. Um, because there's this idea that black feminists don't do religion. And we out here doing religion. We're doing a lot of religion. We're, we're, we're talking, we're even talking theologically. And so, but I, what I introduce in the black, black feminist study of religion is I introduce this different kinds, uh, different ways, a uh, different method, methodological uh, ways of seeing and doing um, certain kinds of work on religion. So that's, I'd like to see this new school of thought. I like to see folks coming. And it's because in that, you also have other books, you have other work, you have other research, 
right? So you have that, but at the same time, I want to see the church shifting. I want to see language shifting. I want to see um, pastors changing how they treat women, how they see them, and how women show up in their sermons. I want to see that. I want to see mothers and fathers, you know, having a text that they could read to liberate their daughters as opposed to imprisoning them, right? Or, or a text that helps them to talk to their sons about sexual shame and the sexual violence that they experience. So that's what, that's what I would like to see. Dr. Tamora Little Max, everyone, let's appreciate her. Yes, what a blessing, what a gift, what a gift. So, if you would like to experience a, a book signing or an event near you, go to www.feministwire.com and go through her page. And I'm sure she has all kinds of booking and things like that. And she will uh, get back to you in due time. You can buy the book on Amazon.com. Um, and uh, the book should be uh, getting restocked as we speak. Thank you all online for joining. Please share this conversation. Hit the share button. Share this conversation. Let's get this conversation going viral. Uh, this is a very important, important part of who the black church has to become yes. if we're going to be a, a, a place of, of liberation for, for all of us. And, and uh, I'm glad to be able to do my part to help make that happen. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Woo!